welcome uh, everybody. Uh, Mary Sukova, Chair, Chief of Neurology. I'm here really to welcome you to the Lisa Kravitsis um, lecture and to welcome uh, Lisa's husband, Joe, who's here with us. Um, Dr. Kravikas um, was a, um, a dear, dear friend and a colleague of ours, a physician in our ALS clinic at Mass General Hospital, and uh, she was Associate Chief of Physical Medicine Rehab at, at MGH and at Spalding Rehab and an Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. Um, Lisa was an engineer uh, from training and then uh, at Cornell and then went to medical school at Harvard at Harvard Medical School, and she was really a very uh, talented clinician uh, and researcher studying muscle physiology, um, the effects of aging, and, uh, and studying ALS therapies. Um, she passed away from ALS in September of 2009. Uh, we remember her every day and her passion for helping people with ALS, and she was really the first physiatrist to, to um, bring physiatry to ALS patients, and one of her um, mentors uh, uh, in her uh, years at Spalding uh, was at that time a, a, a resident uh, with her, uh, Sabrina Paganoni. And one of the things Lisa asked all of us um, was, she said, there's this really talented resident. Um, she's a fabulous physician, a fabulous scientist. I hope she can join your ALS uh, program. And that's exactly what happened. And I'm really thrilled today that our awardee for the Lisa Kravecki the Kravikis lecture is Dr. Sabrina Paganoni, one of her uh, uh, mentees. Uh, Dr. Paganoni is a member of our uh, Healy Center ALS uh, team. She's a, a physician scientist. She trained uh, in um, Milan for medical school and then got a PhD in neuroscience at Northwestern and did her residency at the uh, Spalding Rehab. She's been part of our um, ALS Center since uh, really her fellowship here and in the Brigham MGH Neuromuscular Program and then as faculty here. She's a leader in clinical trials and innovation. And uh, I, I think you're gonna really enjoy hearing from her and all the, the major uh, advances in ALS. And I'll just say, because she won't be able to say it, her critical role um, in leading these trials and training the next generation of uh, ALS physician scientists. And with that, um, I'll turn the Zoom and the lecture to Dr. Paganoni. Congratulations on this award. And uh, your plaque is in your office. And I'm sorry, we can't give it to you in person here. Thank you, Merit, and welcome, everyone. Uh, this is the 10th meeting of the annual Lisa Krivikas Grand Rounds, and the number 10 means a lot to me. Uh, it's an opportunity for me to reflect on everything that happened over the last decades and to reflect on the meaning of time. I, I always tell my children that the most important thing in life is to use the time that we have been given for a purpose. And in my professional, professional life, I've been using this time to find treatment for ALS. As, as Merit said, when I was a resident about 10 years ago, I was mentored by Dr. Krivikas. In fact, Dr. Krivikas is the one reason why I dedicated my research career to ALS. So it is inspiring and moving for me to be here today to remember her uh, and to thank her family who is here to represent her. When Dr. Krivikas developed ALS, she mentored me. She encouraged me to continue her research as a physiatrist at MGH, and she introduced me to, uh, to Mary Sukovic. And everything I've been working on for the last 10 years is the fruit of the encounter with these two extraordinary people, Dr. Krivikas first, and through her, Dr. Sukovic. For, for those of us who care about ALS, 2020 will be remembered not as the year of the great pandemic, but the year uh, when we turned the corner in ALS. In fact, so much happened in 2020 that I don't have the time to cover it all. But I do want to tell you the story of the trials that we've been conducting here at the MGH and how I think they're changing the paradigm for ALS. The CENTAR trial was completed in 2020 and we hope that it will soon lead to the approval of a new treatment for ALS. And building on the progress we made, we are excited about the Healy ALS platform trial, which is allowing us to test more investigational products in less time. And the platform trial opened a whole new frontier. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some new developments and opportunities. Faculty and staff in the most general Brigham system uh, are some of the most creative and collaborative people I've ever met. So let me tell you the story about how the center trial got started. This is the story of how two college students who had a brilliant idea were taken ser seriously by our faculty. 
So together we engaged the entire ALS community and here we are with a successful trial that could hopefully result in the approval of a new treatment for ALS. So the story is this. So while sitting in their dorm at Brown University, uh, Mr. Justin Klee and Joshua Cohen uh, had the idea to combine two drugs that target two common disease mechanisms to treat neurodegenerative diseases. So they thought that if they combined one drug that targets endoplasmic reticulum stress with one drug that targets mitochondrial dysfunction, they would see synergistic effects. So they called Dr. Ruti Tanzi to share their idea. And I believe that Rudy agreed to meet with them mostly because they were in the same fraternity. So Rudy let them test their compound in the lab. And amazingly, it was neuroprotective in culture. So there was something there. Uh, in fact, the results were so positive that Rudy helped them with their newly founded company called Amelix Pharmaceuticals, whose initial focus was Alzheimer's disease. So Rudy introduced uh, them to Merit, who thought that if the results were so positive, why not try an ALS? In fact, ALS, just like Alzheimer's disease, shares uh, dysfunctions, similar cellular uh, dysfunction mechanisms like endoplasmic reticulum stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. So that could be a great opportunity for ALS as well. Merit introduced them to Peter Foss from IS, uh, ALS Finding a Cure. And so that foundation gave Amelix their first grant to do a little bit more toxicology and preclinical work. And the additional preclinical work also was supportive. And, and that's where I entered the story. So that was 2015, I was junior faculty and Merit was my mentor. So one, one day she asked me to join a meeting at building 114 in Charlestown because there was a new company that had a possible new trial. So she said that could be a good opportunity for me to learn how to design and lead clinical trials. So I joined and with Merit's mentorship, I started working with her and other investigators and our statisticians on the grant. And, and the happy ending of the story is that we got the grant, we launched the trial in 2017, and then fast forward a couple of years, we unlocked the database in December 2019, and the positive results led to the discussions that we are having today with the FDA. So let me tell you a little bit about the center trial design and the data. So to start, I would like to acknowledge an amazing group of collaborators, including ALS clinicians, site staff, statisticians, who all worked together and made the center trial possible. So you may recognize on the slide a strong NGH presence. And this is because the trial was coordinated and led by NGH staff. So everything I'm going to talk about today is the fruit of the daily hard work and dedication of this phenomenal team, including so many people who are on the line today, um, so many people from the Healy Center and the NCRI at NGH. And from NGH, we connected with the entire ALS community. So participants were involved at 25 sites of the NILS Consortium in the US. We support from the ALS Association, ALS Finding a Cure, and Amelix Therapeutics. When we designed the trial in 2015, I remember printing out the papers of pretty much every single ALS trial that was ever published up to 2015. So I read them all. But we didn't want to just replicate what had been done before. We wanted to come up with a new design, with the most efficient and most patient-centric design. So the slide here captures several aspects of this work on trial design, and I'll touch upon them over the next few minutes. One point that's very dear to me is that we had one patient and one caregiver help us with study design. Their contribution was a constant reminder of why we do trials and helped us select a few features uh, that made the trial patient-centered. Many of the trials that we see today actually adopt these features. So one might take them for granted, but in 2015, when we designed the trial and applied for the grant, each of these aspects was innovative. For, for example, we chose to have a randomization of two to one in favor of active, keeping the randomized phase very short and allowing participants to go on open label extension so that they could get access to active drug after participating in the placebo control period of the trial. The investigational product that we tested in Center is known as AMX35. AMX35 is a co-formulation of two compounds, PB or sodium phenylbutyrate and terso or ter or sodial. So as I said earlier, AMX35 was designed to mitigate two pathways implicated in ALS, endoplasmic reticulum stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. 
the individual components and had shown activity in preclinical models of neurodegenerative diseases, including uh, in, in, in labs at MGH. But when Amelix Pharmaceuticals combined them, they saw an even greater impact, a synergistic impact of the combination on uh, neuronal cell death uh, in cell culture. The pharmaceutical grade combination known as AMX35 comes as a powder that's packaged in uh, packets or sachets. It's dissolved in water and can be taken by mouth or feeding tube. Uh, participants in the trial started taking the drug once a day and then they were titrated to uh, twice a day after three weeks. Center was a 24 week randomized double blind placebo control trial. And the primary objectives were to determine the safety and tolerability of AMX35 and to measure the impact of AMX35 on the ALS functional rating scale. Center was powered to detect a treatment effect on this primary efficacy endpoint, the ALS FRSR, which is the most commonly used outcome measure in ALS trials. We randomized 137 participants two to one active to placebo and treated them for 24 weeks, or so about six months. Key inclusion criteria included a diagnosis of definite ALS and participants needed to be early in their disease course. And I'll go into more details about why we selected this criteria. Participants could take Riluzol uh, and or Edaravon during the study. These are the two FDA approved medications for ALS. They're not super effective, but they do provide a modest advantage. And so we didn't want to compare the drug to pure placebo. We wanted to compare the drug to standard of care with the idea that the drug would provide added value on top of standard of care. And, and, and the field now is moving towards the idea of combination treatment, just like we do for cancer or even heart disease. Um, because many different cellular pathways are, are implicated, we think that ultimately it's gonna be a combination of treatment uh, that we need to, to give our patients. So participants who completed all visits in the randomized period were given the option to enroll in an open label extension where all participants received active drug or AMX35. This was well received. In fact, 92% of center completers opted to enroll in the open label extension, which is still ongoing. The inclusion and exclusion criteria of center were meant to enroll a homogeneous, fast progressing participant population with the aim of increasing statistical power by reducing heterogeneity and excluding those who were unlucky to progress during the study. This is key because uh, we have seen in other ALS trials that variability between patients can be so dramatic that then that will dilute the result. So it was important for us to select a homogeneous population to uh, increase our statistical power and be able to see a treatment effect if there was any uh, in a relatively small and relatively short um, trial. Uh, for, for to, to, to make progress as fast as possible. So the two criteria that we selected were definite ALS and 18 months from onset. This criteria was uh, were selected based on extensive statistical model modeling to increase statistical power. We looked at different trial cohorts as indicated in the table. Uh, PROACT is, a, is the largest publicly available database of ALS clinical trials. It was put together uh, by Alex Sherman and his, and his team here at MGH. It's a phenomenal tool for research and for statistical modeling. And you can see here that um, in PROACT, as well as in the other databases, um, you know, if we look at all comers, the average monthly decline in ALS FRSR is one point per month. But when you use the key criteria that we used for center, the population uh, is, uh, progresses at a much faster rate. Uh, so we have a steeper slope, uh, which gives us more statistical power, and uh, also because we basically exclude those who are unlikely to progress during the study and unlikely to contribute to the results. Baseline characteristics were similar between AMX35 and the placebo groups in the trial. This is a snapshot of their characteristics. On average, they were 57. Uh, they were about one year from the beginning of uh, the symptoms and six months from diagnosis. About a quarter of participants at bulbar onset, and the majority of participants were either on Riluzol or a Edaravon or both at study entry. First, let's review the key functional outcome from the randomized period. So we measured function during the double blind period of the trial. Uh, which is a six month period. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the ALS FRSR, I just wanted to spend a few seconds to explain how we measure physical function in ALS. 
the ALSFRSR is the most commonly used scale in ALS trials, and we basically measure independence uh, with activities that matter to patients, such as the ability to speak, the ability to swallow, the ability to write, the ability to, um, to walk or negotiate st uh, stairs. So we, um, we ask a series of questions, 12 questions. Each question is uh, scored on a scale from zero to four, where four is normal. And on this scale, uh, for each question, even a change in one point can mean the difference between being independent with that activity or needing assistance uh, for that particular activity. So it matters to patients. So the, the first message here is that the center trial met its pre-specified primary endpoint. AMX 35 participants are labeled in red at the top and placebo in blue at the bottom. Over a six month period, there was a difference in slope of ALS FRSR total score, indicating a slowing of functional decline among patients that were receiving AMX 35 compared to placebo. This was measured over a six month period. And as you can see here, the drug did not stop and did not reverse the disease. However, it did slow it down significantly. Uh, the results were statistically significant in the pre-specified analysis. Uh, and and the, at the end of the six month study, the difference between the two groups were uh, 2.3 points, uh, which I believe is clinically significant. But as I said earlier, after the randomized period, participants were allowed to enter the open label extension and receive active drug long-term. So we followed all these patients from the time of initial randomization through their open label experience if they opted in. And then we were able to actually do a survival analysis on everyone, not just the people who enter the open label extension, which is the majority, but everyone, even the ones that were lost to follow up, and I'll explain how. So essentially the pre-specified overall survival analysis that I'm going to present now includes all 137 participants that were randomized in the center trial and basically starts from the start of randomization in 2017 up to the cutoff date uh, which was July of 2020. So an important point I want to highlight is that, again, we were able to do survival analysis on every participant in center, including those who withdrew, were lost to follow up, or did not enroll in the OLE, because we used um, a, a search uh, firm called Omnitrace that can locate participants um, and determine vital status based on public record records. So this is actually a method that's used frequently in other diseases, like oncology, but it's new to ALS. It's the first time that was used in ALS. So the pre-specified survival analysis compared essentially the time to death for any cause between all the participants that were originally randomized to AMX 35 and the participants who were originally randomized to placebo. And the cutoff date was uh, July 20, 2020. That was basically 35 months, so really two weeks shy of three years of follow-up from start of randomization up to uh, July 2020. So we, uh, we compared essentially the original AMX group that included 89 participants to the original uh, placebo group that included 48 participants. But again, remember that most of them then switched over to open label extension after six months. So the duration of exposure to AMX35 is summarized here uh, in this swimmer's plot for every randomized participant. So because most people moved on to OLE, even the original placebo group received at least some um, AMX35, although obviously the placebo group had a delayed start. So essentially they started six months later compared to the uh, AMX group that started right away. So if you look at all uh, randomized participants, including all, uh, all of those who did not enroll, those originally randomized to AMX35 had a median exposure to AMX35 of 8.8 .8 months, and those originally randomized to placebo had a median exposure of 1.9 months. Obviously, in the placebo group, all exposure in occurred in the open label extension because there was again a, a six month delayed start, but there was variability uh, in, the, in the total amount uh, and we're disclosing, um, you know, kind of patient level data in the swimmers plot. So in the pre-specified survival analysis encompassing all participants in center, the risk of death was 44% lower among those who were originally randomized to AMX35 compared with those originally randomized to placebo. So if you look at median survival and you compare the AMX group to the placebo group, you see that there is a 6.5 month difference between the groups. So 
people who were originally randomized to AMX 35 lived on average 6.5 months longer. And as a reminder, 77% of participants were already on Rilusol or Edarvon at the beginning of the study. And actually we did some sensitivity analysis and, uh, to, um, impact the, uh, to assess the impact of concomitant medications on the survival results. And results of the sensitivity analysis were consistent with the primary analysis. So essentially the effect of AMX 35 on survival was consistent regardless of the underlying use of Rilusol and Adaravon. Again, this is an added medication on top of standard of care. So the data that I have presented so far had already been published. Uh, we published uh, the results of the randomized period in September 2020 in the New England Journal of Medicine and the uh, second part, the survival data, was published in October of 2020 in Muscle and Nerve. So now I would like you to briefly review some new data that we have not published yet. So after seeing these exciting results of the survival analysis, uh, many in the ALS community um, asked us a few questions. So first, uh, a few people asked us if the two groups, AMX35 and placebo were well matched to begin with. Of course, we knew based on baseline characteristics that they were, but we wanted to do additional analysis to really confirm that. Another important question is that center enrolled a very specific population, a fast progressing population. So the question that we received is, what is the expected survival for this uh, type of population? And how does the uh, survival that we observed compare to the predicted one? And finally, people wanted to know if the participants who were originally randomized to placebo got some benefit from participating in the open label extension because again, most of them did receive some AMX35, only that they received it with a six month delay. So to answer these additional questions, we partnered with our colleagues in Europe. Um, there is, uh, you know, as you know, there is a, a trial consortium in, in the US called uh, NEALS. There is a corresponding um, consortium in Europe called ENCALS. Uh, and they also have this working group called TRICALS, uh, which is based uh, in the Netherlands and includes researchers from all over Europe. And so essentially what the TRICALS researchers did was to use something called the ENCALS survival prediction model that predicts survival of patients with ALS based on population-based registries from across Europe. Uh, thousands and thousands of patients from several European countries contributed to this model. And so this model essentially allows us to uh, compare observed results in trials to predicted results based on population um, data. So the group um, at TRICALS produced survival predictions for each individual participant in our trial, in the center trial. So each participant had a projected curve predicting the probability of survival at each time point. And then those predictions were compared with what we uh, actually observed in the uh, center trial. So our first question was, were the two groups, the original AMX group and the original placebo group well matched? So we calculated the risk profile based on this uh, prediction model. And, and here you can see essentially the same data uh, presented in two different graphs. And you can see the probability distribution of risk for each group on the left and uh, the same information on the right in box plots. And, and both figures basically show that uh, the two groups are, are comparable. Uh, and so it, essentially the model suggests that the two groups were uh, well matched a baseline. And another analysis we did was to also look at the predictive survival for both groups in center. And you can see that their predictive survival based on the model was the same. So again, um, suggesting that the two groups were comparable with a similar predictive prognosis in terms of probability of survival. So our next question was, well, center enrolled a fast progressing population. What is the expected survival for this type of population? So here we're looking at the predictive survival for the group of people that was originally randomized to AMX35. And so the natural prognosis for this uh, group uh, is essentially a median survival of 13.5 months after randomization in this, uh, based on this um, prediction model. So now we can look at the, uh, what we observed for our participants, the same participants, you know, the actual observed survival was much longer, was a median survival of 25 months, as I showed uh, previously. So the difference was 11.5 months, almost one year. Uh, and this is 
longer than what I showed um, previously. So previously, we in the pre-specified analysis, we saw a 6.5 month longer survival. And here we see uh, almost a one year survival advantage. But remember that the original pre-specified analysis I showed earlier is not really an active to placebo comparison because the vast majority of participants in the placebo group actually did receive the drug, the active drug, as part of the open label extension. So it's not so surprising to see that the actual, um, you know, the, the actual survival benefit might be longer, at least based on these um, analyses uh, comparing to uh, predicted uh, based on natural history data. And our final question was, did the original placebo group, the majority of whom received the EMX35 with a six month delay, show longer uh, survival than what we would have predicted. So here we're looking at the predictive survival of the original placebo group and we're comparing it to the actual observed survival of this placebo group and you can see that it's longer. It's about six months longer and the difference is less in this group than in the original AMX35 group and the separation seems to occur a little later uh, and again this is Perhaps this is due to the fact that the placebo group uh, received drug with a six month delay. And finally on the right, we can look at the, at the small group of participants that never received the MX35. This is the small group of participants that uh, started on placebo and did not go into the OLE. And uh, actual survival in this group was not statistically significant, was not significantly different from predicted um, in this model. However, the numbers are small. So it's kind of hard to make definitive conclusions, but it's certainly very intriguing data. So to quickly recap in terms of this most recent um, survival uh, prediction analysis, both the originally randomized to AMX35 and originally randomized to placebo groups showed uh, longer survival than predicted by the model. Uh, so again, this uh, raises the possibility that uh, in our trial, we, we sort of underestimated the actual survival advantage because we gave people the option to enroll in the open label extension. Again, as part of that patient-centric trial design that I mentioned at the very beginning, also, this data raised the possibility that participants who received delayed exposure to the drug, uh, so the people who were originally on placebo and received AMX 35 with a six month delay may have also been benefit, uh, may have also benefited. And so we will need to confirm that in future studies. So let me just summarize this first part of the, of the talk. Uh, what we saw was that this new drug, AMX35, its administration was associated with both a functional and survival benefit in people with ALS. Uh, and let me add that this is the first drug to show positive effects on both function and survival in an ALS trial because the two drugs that we have available, Riluzol and Edarvon, only uh, act on survival and function respectively, but not both. So this is the first time that we see an effect on both outcomes. And importantly, we did allow participants to have access to Rilosol and Edaravon in our trial. So our results are on top of standard of care. So we saw a significant slowing of functional decline over the six month randomized period. And we saw longer survival uh, in our survival analysis. Uh, and the exploratory analysis raises the potential that the, the real survival advantage might be even longer than what we originally saw um, based on um, natural history data. And I didn't show the safety data, but um, it was reassuring to see that the drug is actually uh, safe and well tolerated. Um, it's also easy, it will be easy to prescribe. There's no need for lab monitoring. Uh, there's you know, really no need for EKG monitoring or anything like that. So it's, it's quite safe and well tolerated. So we were so excited when we saw the positive results of the center trial. However, as I said earlier, the drug does not stop or does not reverse the disease. So our work is not done. So our next step was to launch a trial that would allow us to test more investigational products in less time. And, and that's the Healy ALS platform trial. So if you think about it, to run a trial, even a successful trial like Center, we need to build a stadium or a trial infrastructure to test one treatment. In fact, we did build a stadium, uh, a whole infrastructure to, to run Centaur, uh, and it took some time. You know, we, we started enrolling in, you know, we started planning for it in 2015, 2016, and we started it in 2017. The trial infrastructure was then dismantled at the end of the trial and cannot be reused again. It's as if, to make an analogy, in order to play a football game, um, the NFL had to build a stadium just for that one game, a stadium that cannot be used again. That's not an efficient way to play football, nor is it an efficient way to test drugs. 
So we asked ourselves, is there a more efficient way? We, le we learned from colleagues in cancer that there is a better way, and it's called the platform approach. In the platform approach, you can test multiple treatments all at the same time. And how is this possible? Well, essentially, you have to build your stadium at the very beginning. You want to make it optimal, an optimized trial infrastructure, and you want to keep it open long term to reuse it to test multiple drugs so that you don't need uh, all the time to do startup or, or you know, design the trial or, or do all the operational activities that are needed to start one single trial. You just build the trial at the beginning and you keep it open to continue to test as many drugs as you want. And this concept is what led to the Healy ALS platform trial. So we launched the Healy ALS platform trial in 2020, uh, and the goal of this is to dramatically accelerate the pace of ALS drug development. This is actually the first platform trial for ALS in the world. Uh, I'm glad to report that there is huge excitement for the trial. Uh, and actually, we opened the trial in the middle of the pandemic and yet experienced enrollment rates that are higher than what we had seen in recent studies in non-pandemic times. And this is the result of uh, planning, collaboration, dedication to the project. You can see on this slide that there are several academic partners, industry partners, patient groups, foundations that are all supporting the trial. And the list keeps growing and I'm delighted to see that, you know, uh, I know that some of you are on the line today. So thank you for your support. What brought us together? Well, we go back to what Sandy told us. Sandy is one of our patient advisors. Uh, she thought that the, the patients with ALS do not live on the human time clock. The ALS clock is a lot faster. So we were inspired to develop a trial that would work on the ALS clock. The vision and opportunity came in November 2018 when the Healy Center was founded with the mission of accelerating innovation for a cure. And it was uh, Merit uh, who had the idea to bring platform trials to ALS for the first time. So our research told us that compared to a traditional trial, a platform trial would cut the drug development timelines in half, would cut costs by a third, and would drastically reduce the need for a placebo. And this is exactly what we're seeing in the trial. However, the platform approach does require a great deal of planning and collaboration. So for this reason, we started working with the entire ALS community to design a trial that would be a win-win for everyone, always keeping patients front and center. We've been receiving phenomenal advice from an engaged patient advisory committee. They helped us fine tune the design to ensure that this is a trial that people with ALS want to participate in. In fact, we uh, received a five-star designation from IM ALS. We, we were the first trial to receive top scores on their patient-centric trial design rating scale. We also had a series of meetings with industry representatives because we wanted to include their perspective from the beginning. And they shared with us that the three key elements that make a trial attractive to industry are expertise, execution and efficiency. And so we tackled all of them. So we designed the trial to ensure that industry partners would have access to experts. Uh, we all experts um, from the NIST consortium, experts uh, in many different aspects of ALS science so that they have access to all of that. We're executing the trial through the NILS consortium, uh, which is an amazing consortium of trial ready sites uh, with an experienced coordination center. Uh, Merit founded the, the, the consortium many years ago and we uh, coordinate the consortium from the MGH in collaboration with uh, the Barrow Neurological Institute. We also engaged with the FDA from the very beginning and we received uh, thoughtful guidance and support. And it's actually, this is actually key because we, um, as discussed with the FDA, uh, the trial design that we discussed with them and we agreed upon is such that if there is a positive result, this trial could serve as the pivotal trial for that drug. So it's very important to design it with certain features that make a drug approvable uh, if, if there are uh, positive results. So we were able to design and launch the trial in just about one year. Two key committees worked hand in hand to make this possible, the trial design committee and the clinical operations team. And then really worked hand in hand because you cannot just design and then implement, you have to do both at the same time because the platform trial is such a different approach compared to a different trial that you have to do it hand in hand. So the trial design committee that you see pictured here includes ALS investigators and statisticians. And, and then the uh, clinical operations team manages all aspects of the trial 
from data capture to site monitoring and regulatory. So each picture here represents an entire team, a large team, and I'm really grateful to everyone at the NGH Neurological Clinical Research Institute for their daily dedication to this project. They're really, um, you know, taking care of all the operations and the trial would not be possible without uh, all their work. So let's switch gears now and let me tell you a little bit about the design of the trial. So we're testing multiple investigational products in parallel by using a shared infrastructure and a common protocol, also known as a master protocol. This allows us to um, gain the efficiencies that save time, money, and reduce placebo use. So let me tell you how this works from a participant perspective. So we have a two-step informed consent and randomization process, which is different from regular trials. So when participants enroll in the trial, they're randomly assigned to any of the available regimen. And when I say regimen here, I'm referring to active treatment and matching placebo. This first assignment is random, but it's not blind. So this means that both the participant and the investigator will know which regimen that individual is assigned to. Then there is a second consent and randomization, and there, uh, the participant will be randomized to either active or placebo within that uh, regimen. And this time the randomization is blind. Of note, because of the master protocol structure, we can share placebo data among regimens. So the randomization ratio within each regimen is three to one active to placebo in favor of active. However, at the end of the trial, we can share placebo data from uh, different regimens. And so each investigational product is compared to the shared placebo group. So we're not comparing dr drug to drug, we're comparing each drug against the shared placebo group. So the, the platform trial is governed by master protocol. The master protocol is like a house and our house can host many regimens, but we do have rules in the house. So we spent a great deal of time to define these rules or key elements of the master protocol. So as in any protocol, we had to lay out, lay out the target population, endpoints, sample size, treatment duration, randomization ratio. We also had to spend a lot of time defining a few features that are unique to a platform trial. For example, placebo sharing, adaptive features, and of note the trial is perpetual as it meant to, and it is meant to grow over time to accommodate more drugs as they become available. And adaptive features include things like interim analysis to stop early for futility or success. So there's, there's a lot of, of simulation uh, and statistical modeling that goes into this. So let me briefly review some of the key elements of the master protocol. So we are enrolling 160 participants per drug for each regimen. They are randomized to either active or placebo in a three to one ratio within the regimen. But remember the placebo data is shared. So at the, at the end of the trial for each drug, really the, the final analyses are performed on about 240 individuals, 120 on active and 120 on placebo that includes the 40 participants on placebo within the regimen and 80 placebo participants from other regimens. They're borrowed from other regimens. The double blind period lasts six months. And at the end of the period, participants are offered the option to enroll in an open label extension. This is similar in a way to the design of the center trial. So we have a randomized period at the beginning, six months. We want to keep it as short as possible. And that's important to patients so that they are not randomized to placebo potentially uh, for a long period of time. And then everyone is given the option to enter an open label extension. And that open label extension, just like in center, will allow us to capture long-term safety and efficacy data. So we put a lot of thought into our target population. We selected the key inclusion criteria that you see here based on extensive statistical modeling. Our guiding principle was to allow as much access as possible while also maintaining good statistical power. So the criteria are a little bit broader than other trials, but again, there was a lot of statistical modeling to ensure that we would have good statistical power. And in this trial, just like we did in center, we allow participants to take standard of care medications, Reluzol and Edaravon, and if a new drug gets approved, we will allow participants to also take that new drug. So again, the idea here is to test each investigational product against standard of care with the idea that ultimately we will need a combination of treatments for maximum effect uh, to, to best treat ALS. And so it's, uh, you know, every new treatment will need to uh, add uh, to the puzzle. 
So our primary endpoint is the change in disease severity through 24 weeks as measured by the um, ALS functional rating scale accounting for mortality. And we also capture ALS relevant secondary endpoints such as respiratory function, muscle strength and survival. And we also collect a set of biofluids to measure biomarkers as applicable. Now we do have an extensive set of exploratory endpoints and I want to spend a minute to talk about it because we want to use the platform trial as an engine to develop new data, new knowledge, new biomarkers, new outcomes. So we want to use the trial to also benefit other trials and the entire field so that in addition to testing the drugs and to test more drugs in less time, we can also uh, add to ALS science and to the entire field. So specifically, we are collecting DNA and several biofluids, such as neurofilaments and other biomarkers. In addition, we have two different smartphone apps to measure speech and respiratory function in the home environment. So uh, speech analysis has been a, a long interest of ours. And then home spirometry is a more recent addition. We added it a little after we launched the trial because as, as most of you know, hospitals began restricting spirometry due to concerns that it might spread the COVID-19 virus. So when the pandemic broke out, we amended the master protocol to make it more COVID resilient. So we added home spirometry, we added options for telemedicine, options for home nursing. Uh, and this, really, uh, this was really a great example of how the master protocol concept can be very efficient because essentially we amended one protocol and by amending that, we amended the protocol for all the investigational products that we were, um, um, we were uh, testing. So not just one, but all of them at the same time. We've actually been interested in developing digital endpoints for a while, and now we are able to explore these tools in the platform trial. So I spoke about the master protocol so far, and I told you that the master protocol is like a house that can host multiple regimens. Each regimen occupies one floor and is described in the regimen specific appendix, which is an addendum to the master protocol. Again, that's another efficiency. Uh, when we add a new drug, we just add an addendum. So it's faster from an IRB and FDA perspective. And each appendix or addendum will describe the details of that particular drug that's tested in that specific regimen, such as the safety profile, for example. Of note, uh, our guests can come and go. In fact, we started out with three guests, regimens A, B, and C. After a few months, we added regimen D, and now we're designing regimens E and F, and, and we're actually very big on color coding, so every regimen and all the study materials have an associated color. We have not picked the colors for E and F yet. So our goal here is to always have spots available for patients, so that by the time we are done enrolling for regimen A, B, C, and D, we already have ENF ready to go, so that there's always spots available for our patients. The regimens that we are testing right now are Zellucoplan, Verdiperstat, CNMAU8, and Predopidin. Each of these drugs is made by a different company. They actually work on very different mechanisms of action. Zellucoplan uh, works on complement um, inhibition. Verdiperstat is a myeloperoxidase inhibitor working to uh, reduce microglial activation. CNMAU8 works on energy production and predopidine is a sigma-1 receptor agonist. And, and the reason we are testing multiple drugs with multiple different uh, mechanisms of action is really because we don't know uh, ultimately, you know, uh, what the mechanism of action underlying ALS is for all patients. And it's actually a combination probably. So, so we probably need more than one drug that uh, addresses different targets to to really try to slow down uh, the neurodegenerative process as, as efficiently as possible. So the trial is also a phenomenal collaboration with many industry partners. We work with all of them on a daily basis. And there really are amazing synergies when academia and industry work together. So I think this is a great example of uh, a fantastic academic environment like uh, the one we have at our institution and also working in, in synergistic ways with industry. So how do we keep all of this organized? So I'm here, I'm just quickly reviewing the governance structure of the trial. So we try to keep the number of committees to a minimum, but we also wanted to make sure that this trial receives input from all key stakeholders. So I'm not gonna go through all the details. I'm just gonna share the basic principle. We have a central executive committee that oversees the entire trial, but we get a lot of input from investigators, patients, foundations, and industry. It's really a phenomenal collaborative effort. 
every regimen, each regimen is actually led by a different investigator. Um, we have a lead investigator and a co-lead investigator as well as a steering committee with other investigators. And this is very important to us. So the, the lead investigator of every regimen is an experienced ALS clinical trialist and the co-lead is a trialist in training. We also have new trialists uh, as part of the steering committee uh, and different patient representatives, representatives of the community. So this framework allows us to, uh, to leverage the experience of many and the lead investigator again is leading the, the, um, the regimen in collaboration with um, more junior researchers and so this is also a way for us to train the new generation of ALS clinical trialists. So we are excited that the platform trial is changing the pace of drug development. The Healy trial opened in 2020 and results for the first four drugs are expected about one year after initial launch. And we expect to launch two to three regimens every year. So really, if you think about it here, we're gonna have results for four drugs in one year, as opposed to results for one drug every so often. So really it's a dramatic acceleration of the pace. So when we look at the year 2020, I really think that we can say that we turned the corner in ALS, and this is just the beginning. So the platform trial opened a whole new frontier. I just want to take a couple of minutes to talk about some new developments and opportunities and something I think will really be a revolution moving forward. So let me give you some background information first. So we all know, based on research, that only 10% of people with ALS participate in clinical trials, and there are many reasons for this. The point here is that we are missing the opportunity to learn from the majority of people with ALS. So just prior to the pandemic, I attended a workshop and I spoke with an FDA officer who told me something that really struck me. So he told me that prior to joining the FDA, he worked as a pediatric oncologist. And, and he told me that 90% of his pediatric patients, patients with pediatric cancer, participated in some form of research. So the exact opposite happens in ALS. So in ALS, 90% of our patients do not participate in research. So I remember coming back to Boston and telling a couple of colleagues, so imagine a world where all ALS participants are given the opportunity to participate in research. We want to create a scenario where everyone can contribute and everyone can be part of the solution. So at the end of 2020, we received two grants that I think are a good step in this direction. And, and hopefully this is our goal for the next year. So we received a grant from the Tambourine Collaborative to increase, incre increase uh, access and inclusion in ALS trials, and also a grant from IM ALS to establish the first multi-center expanded access program for ALS. So to, to increase uh, access and inclusion. We started a series of initiatives. We've been interested in this for a long time and now we're really gonna take it to the next level. So we, we have a wonderful research access nurse whose job is to connect patients to research opportunities at MGH. And we recently launched a patient navigator role to essentially replicate and expand this model on a national basis. So we hired Catherine and Alison, our patient navigation team. They joined us in late 2020 and their job is to connect ALS patients to research opportunities nationwide. So for example, for the platform trial, we have three, uh, three sites in Philadelphia. And so how do we maximize enrollment there? So when patients call, Catherine and Allison can direct them to the, the site that has the, the shortest waiting list that can enroll them uh, faster. So that's the idea to connect people to opportunities in different cities so that different clinics don't work in isolation, but are connected and can facilitate access. This is just one of the other things we're working on. One thing I learned also is that in order to increase access, communication is key. And in this virtual environment, we need to continue to adapt the way we communicate with patients and with the general public. So to this end, we revamped our website, we developed videos, we developed material for patients, we continue to develop that in collaboration with our patient advisors. They keep giving us lots of ideas. And we are also available on live webinars. Now webinars now are the way to go. We are all on webinar today. Uh, but when, we, when the center study was enrolling, when the first trial I, I discussed was enrolling in 20. 17, 2019, we started doing public webinars then. We were doing them every quarter and that was well received and we thought it was a good cadence. But then when we launched the platform trial in 2020, we started out with monthly webinars because we wanted to connect more frequently. But by September, 2020, the patient community asked us specifically to hold weekly webinars. So 
access to technology continues to improve and expectations change. So now we have a weekly webinar. Every Thursday, in fact, this afternoon, we have a standing meeting with the patient community. We invite guest speakers, we post on social media, we post the recordings, and we are available every week to answer any and all questions that the community might have. And again, I think this is just the beginning of new ways to connect uh, and to increase access and participation. Another project we're actively working on is a series of expanded access studies. So uh, not everyone uh, can participate in formal trials because of uh, eligibility criteria. So expanded access means providing access to experimental drugs to patients who are otherwise not eligible for clinical trials. So why do we do that? Well, first of all, to increase access and, and give people uh, opportunities to, to, uh, to access uh, these drugs. But also this model, if done well, can also increase knowledge because we can collect safety biomarker and clinical data in a broader population, in a population that otherwise would not be captured in formal trials. We do have experience, positive experience with a few EAPs, uh, single center basis that were done at the Healy Center over the last couple of years, but uh, now we are starting to do multi-center EAPs. And for this project, uh, the grant that we received recently, we are enrolling 35 patients with ALS at three sites that are already part of the platform trial. And we're testing, uh, we're giving them access to one drug, Verdiprestat, which is one of the four drugs that are being tested in the platform. And this program is only open to people who are not eligible for the platform trial. And we are collecting uh, clinical and safety data in this broader population. As part of this project, we are also creating enduring materials, best practice, practice processes that will be freely available to the community to facilitate knowledge, awareness, and the development of other EAPs. So the goal here is to create many EAPs at most, if not all, trial sites for uh, most, if not all, platform trial drugs, and, and also to create more access, um, more uh, expanded access programs for people with ALS, also beyond the platform trial. So everything I spoke so far is the result of amazing teamwork and it really takes a village to design trials, lead trials, and also to develop new ideas and creative projects. So my village is called the Neurological Clinical Research Institute. The NCRI is an amazing team of over 100 faculty and staff. They're all leaders in trial design and management. And so I'm, I want to say that I'm incredibly grateful to Merit, who founded the Institute with Steven Greenberg uh, many years ago, uh, and for laying the foundation for everything that we do today. I also do want to acknowledge Dr. James Barry, who has been a fantastic colleague, friend, and sounding board for many years. And I, I learned so much from you, James, and so I want to thank you. And also thank the other faculty, amazing faculty at the NCRI, and all the staff, the directors, we have great groups, um, project management, admin, site operations, biorepository quality, central IRB, data management, data capture system, grants, contracts, everyone really collaborates. Um, it's really a village, everyone helps each other. It's phenomenal uh, work, every group as a director and a wonderful team. So I want to thank each team member for their daily dedication. I, I want to say that every week is really a new adventure at the NCRI. So thank you for uh, making me want to get up and come to work every Monday morning. I look forward to more adventures together. And my adventures would not be possible without the support of visionary leaders, Dr. Sukovic, Chair of Neurology, Dr. Zafont, Chair of PMNR, and I want to thank you for your support and for keeping the collaborative bridge strong between our departments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Paganoni. That was wonderful. We, I just want to open up the floor for questions. There are a couple that will go over already, but if anyone wants to ask questions, they can feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A or to raise your hand via Zoom and we'll get through everything. But first of all, I want to add congratulations that Dr. Zakovic put in the chat that the Centaur paper was voted as one of the top 10 papers in 2020 by the Clinical Research Forum and that many folks added their congratulations as well. Thank you. Um, so to just start some of the questions, Dr. Plotkin had asked um, that you discuss the benefit in Centaur based on median survival times and was wondering if you have data on differences in the proportion of long-term survivors as the tail of the survival curve also holds important data. 
That's a great question. Uh, and, and actually, perhaps, you know, we, we can talk more about it. Um, I think there is uh, some of these I think we can learn from oncology, uh, certainly. Um, and, and I think, you know, we, we have to look more into this. Uh, we did see a few patients who seem to respond more. Uh, so I think that's something that we, uh, we need to explore. Uh, right now, we're in the process, for example, of looking at some genetic data. Uh, I don't know if that's going to be the answer, but certainly something to, to maybe discuss more with you as well. Uh, because again, we, it seems like we are learning from oncology a lot. <laughs> and so perhaps there's something there that we, we need to, to talk about and then maybe see if there's more opportunities and more data. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Dr. Swarzchild also added his congratulations and asked if a key premise for Centaur's combo was synergy across mechanisms. Were you surprised not to see synergy with adiravone or rilazole given distinct actions? And would you recommend these prescribed together? That's a great question also. Uh, so it's also very complex. So we, we didn't see a synergy. And so we think really the effect was additive. Um, we, we have value again uh, on top of, of standard of care. Uh, we still need to do more, I think, more work to see, um, you know, uh, Again, there might be different, you know, parallel pathways, and we need to to slow them down or target all of them in parallel. Some of them might be synergistic. Some of them just, you know, again, might work in parallel. And we just provide added value, but uh, but we didn't. We don't have preclinical data, I think, specifically for Riluzol and Edaravon, But it's something to look more into. Fantastic. And Dr. Mateen also added her congratulations and asked, how do you address the use of complementary and alternative medicine among ALS trial participants? Record it, discourage it, other? That's, that's a hot topic, yeah. So, uh, so I can tell you that in ALS trials, for most trials, um, we don't allow participants to take drugs or supplements uh, that are in trials right now. So if there is a supplement, so for example, curcumin comes to mind. Curcumin is a supplement that you buy over the counter. However, it is being tested in a formal clinical trial because there are there's some data suggesting that it might have some activity. So that particular supplement we prohibit in the trial because we, we don't want to, that to have an impact on the ultimate outcome. Uh, but other supplements for, for, for which there isn't as much science uh, and there's no active trial, we allow, we do record uh, all of them. Uh, so again, uh, it's, it's a little a bit of a nuanced answer. You know, it depends. Uh, if, if there is strong evidence and the drug is being tested in another trial, we prohibit that. If not, we allow it. Thank you. And Dr. Franz added his congratulations and thanks. Thank you for trailblazing work for other PMNR trained neuromuscular certified physicians and researchers. And asked also, how could cell transplant therapies fit into the platform model? That's a great question. So, um, so we. We, we allow drugs, I didn't actually talk about it much, but we do allow drugs with different routes of administration. In fact, the first four drugs have different routes of administration, oral or sub-Q. Um, now, if, if, if we're talking about more invasive uh, routes of administration, such as intratecal or, or, or other you know, more invasive procedures, uh, we might need to think about the possibility of continuing to share placebo data, because really the backbone of the platform trial is to be able to share placebo data. And if you include something that's a little bit more invasive in, term of, in terms of administration, that might create some problems in terms of placebo sharing, although we, we can still you know, um, include and then you know, maybe with some limitations on placebo sharing, you, you can still gain efficiencies from the infrastructure. Another option is also to build another platform trial to test drugs that have, for example, all intratecal administration. So that's another option as well. Uh, Sabrina, I wanted to add my uh, congratulations. And again, I, I just know uh, that Lisa's looking at and so proud of everything you've accomplished. Um, you know, yesterday we had um, an FDA meeting that I know you were part of, and one question came up there that I'd love your thoughts on, which is that the Healy Center platform trials are really a model of collaboration um, to solve an, uh, a key problem. And can one use those same principles maybe to solve some other big gaps in knowledge to accelerate um, progress? And I was just wondering your thoughts on that and, and what you think maybe some of the other barriers are. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I would say that, you know, once we you know, I think we just show that it's possible to have this approach. Uh, now, this approach does require a lot of upfront planning and collaboration. So I, I think I share that, you know, that you need to put a lot of thought and work into that. 
However, it is doable. And at the end, everyone gains. It's a win-win for everyone. So I think the same model could certainly be replicated both in ALS to solve other problems with large collaborative projects and also in other areas uh, of medicine, you know, other areas of neurology, other diseases. And I think, uh, you know, once, you, once some of the processes are established, then it's going to be easier, hopefully, to replicate that. And I would say we're particularly lucky to have the expertise in-house, um, not just in terms of trial design, but also operations at the NCRI. So I think, you know, it's really a valuable resource for others who may want to start other platform trials for other diseases or for, for specific questions in, in a disease. Great, thank you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Paganoni. That brings us exactly to 10 o'clock. I just wanna thank you again for sharing this incredibly groundbreaking work with us and congratulations. And I encourage you to scroll through the chat to see the many people that wanted to congratulate you and thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you.